how did you end up with the property here? Um, well, we were very lucky it came on the market and um, it was the old Asheville farm and um, yeah, well, it was the time we had just started looking and it was actually the first property we looked at so um, for us it was ideally situated, um, it was a good size to start with and it was really well set up for horses. We made a few changes but initially we could walk in and bring horses mm. with us and yeah, it was operational from day one. How did you get into horses uh, originally? Well, I used to work in the um, school holidays uh, at Highview Stud, and then um, when I left school, I got the opportunity to get a job at, um, at Highview. Uh, Brent get off, offered me a job, which was very nice of him. And, uh, so I did, I believe, I think about two or three years there, and uh, he gave me a lot of um, opportunities there and uh, skilled me up on the horse side of it, and, and I really loved it and fell in love with the industry. and. So I did my two or three years there and uh, I then went to Australia. Uh, I had a job there in, um, in the Hunter Valley working for uh, Wooden Stud. So I did four years there, which was um, fantastic. Mm. So, and then came back to New Zealand. Yeah. And went back to Highview and when I was working there I met Sarah. That's how the relationship started. So. And was it your guys' plan to always end up doing your own thing? Is that sort of always what you intended? It was, I think, in the long run. Um, we sort of, uh, we, we worked at Highview for about two or three years together. Um, and then we got offered a job at um, Windsor Park. We got approached to um, manage a stud there, uh, part of their farm, which was called Mapley. Well, that's when they took over Mapley. And uh, uh, we did that for seven years. And. Then we sort of had in the back of our minds that we always wanted to uh, do something for ourselves and yeah, we got the opportunity to uh, find this place and um, it came up for, you know, obviously for sale and we sort of grabbed it at open arms and that's when uh, Sarah looked after it while I was sort of working at Windsor so we could uh, pay the mortgage and yep. <laughs> <laughs> keep our feet on the ground and then uh, once I'd probably had about, um, I did five or six years uh, managing the yearlings at uh, Windsor and um, then I decided there well it was time to hopefully come home and really sort of get ourselves into involved in, um, in our, independently in the uh, industry so and that's when we decided we'd obviously do the yearling preparation and and the adjustment side of it and that's what we wanted to really concentrate on because we thought that was sort of our niche market and um, and so it's, yeah it's really worked for us yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the farm here? How many acres have you got? We've got 60 acres. That's all very flat and all very usable. We've got 14 boxes. We've just recently put in a walker, so that's going to be a huge asset for um, the upcoming yelling season, I'm sure. We've been very, very fortunate to have the support of good local trainers or good trainers um, around New Zealand. Many Baker Forsman, Murray and Andrew have been great supporters and we've been very lucky that we've had the opportunity to spell and look after a lot of their good horses and um, yeah, enjoyed the success on the racetrack. We've got some of some outstanding horses coming and spelling here. Is there a certain amount of pressure you feel when these horses turn up? I think you do, there certainly is. I, I, I'd, you'd be lying if you said you, did, you didn't because, because obviously they're, um, they're valuable horses and uh, you want to make sure yeah. that they, they arrive safely and they're looked after and um, nothing goes wrong because yeah, yeah there's, um, there's so much I think you just got to um, treat them all the same though, you can't make rules for better no. ones than others. Obviously they, you know, they might get boxed at nights or if there's a storm coming, as Murray say, bring them in if there's a storm coming. Well, <laughs> it's quite hard to know if a storm's coming yeah. sometimes, but, um, but you do you do your very best to um, keep them safe, but, you know, sometimes you've just got to um, treat them like a horse and as long as they're happy, healthy, um, yeah. But, like, yeah, I remember days when the truck drive out with Mongolian Khan or Dundee on, it's actually a big relief yeah, to know that you've done your job yeah. and they're on their way to their next stage of their career and um, you know and when they you see them running around Randwick or Flemington and winning it's just like a huge um, huge thrill, huge thrill yeah. and yeah nice to know that well we had a little little part um, in that success. Mongolian card in front from Trip to Paris, Mongolian card holding on, Mongolian card a four-year-old again wins the Caulfield Cup. You've also had quite a bit of success yourselves with uh, breeding. Yep, yeah, we were lucky enough to breed a good filly uh, Called Norzita. Yeah, we bred her, and uh, she was a by she was by Thorn Park. So that was a uh, yeah, that was very enjoyable, exciting. You know, to 
bred a champion filly, it was um, yeah something you'd dream about, and for it to happen, it's um, yeah it was just remarkable really, and you know, we got a lot of satis satisfaction out of that, and um, then we bred a stakes winner by um, a full brother to the Norzetta called Hollows. He uh, he won he won stakes winning uh, stakes race as a two year old. So you know we've had a lot of fun with it and enjoyed it. Here's Bonnevelle at the 100, Bonnevelle up to Galo Chop, Bonnevelle takes Galo Chop and Bonnevelle won again. One special little lady who spends her holidays here is Bonneval. When did you first come across her? Um, she actually came back to us after the cracky yelling sales when um, Murray um, purchased her on behalf of um, the boys. Um, so she, uh, she arrived here, she was quite a big filly. Um, yeah, and she went out with her friends um, for a couple of months before she went and got broken in. And um, so we've pretty much had her yeah, to spell ever since then. It's quite a um, lanky, sort of um, quite a scopy big filly when she came from for a yearling. Um, but she has sort of developed and filled it, filled out. And yeah, every time she comes back, you just notice a huge difference in how she's matured and um, strengthened up, and and even mentally, like she's she's never been busy or anything, but she's just a real professional now. You can see it in her. Bonneval is obviously arriving shortly. Can she just go straight out in the paddock or, or can you talk me through the process? First of all we'll check her condition and assess it and think what, she, what we think we should feed her and um, then we'll pop a cover on her. Obviously if she needs a drench we'll give her that and um, the ID gets done as well. And then she'll go into an individual paddock and you know, we'll just let her run around, kick her heels up and uh, yeah, have some fun out there and just relax and have a, have a good break. She'll probably have her front shoes left on, uh, we'll take off her back shoes just so she, uh, just for safety really. Um, yeah, she'll go into a small, smaller paddock for the start, just to, she's obviously hasn't been out in a paddock since she probably left here um, in June, so um, she'll have a little buck and a kick around there and um, she'll probably come in, at, in to be boxed at nights for the first um, week, 10 days, just depending on the weather. Um, just because that's what she's used to and um, yeah, we just like to look after her a little bit to start with till she acclimatises back to New Zealand conditions. We've seen some horses here in, in paddocks of two and others on their own. How do you decide whether they go in with a mate or, or they don't? Um, she'll probably be kept separate um, just because she doesn't mind being separate she, and she'll probably be um, fed a little bit more than some of the others. she have friends all around her, beside her, but um, we'll probably keep her separate. Although we have run her with a friend in the past, but I think she's only out for a brief spell, so we'll just try and get as much condition on her as we can in the short time we've got. Yeah, we'll also know how much she's eating too, so it'll give us a good guideline and whether we can alter that feed or... So yeah, it just get, we can keep a really close eye on her, especially if she's only got that short um, time out. Speaking of the feeding, they're obviously on that resource mix when they're in work, the sort of hard grain. How do you switch them off and what brand do you use and what do you find works well? We use a, a combination of Prides and Dunstan, some that is a little bit grainier, so we give her a little bit of that to start with just so it's not too different for her, but we gradually increase her intake of other products, um, the extruded products and that just to, um, so she gets all the protein she needs but no, no heating. Um, try and keep her as calm and she'll be in, you know, she'll be in good grass and um, she'll get hay at night at this time of the year as well as a big feed. Do you put her on the walker or is there anything else she does or literally just on holiday have a yeah. relax? Hopefully she's just on holiday and has a relax. Um, <laughs> yeah. They might want to put on the walker um, a few days before she comes back in okay. um, but I think it's good for them just to be out. Yeah, chill out. Um, no, you know, no fuss, just um, do, you know, like we're on holiday too, we yeah. like to be um, left alone and just eat what we like and drink what we like and um, just chill out and hopefully in the good weather. <laughs> How long do you think it takes them during that process? I mean, every horse is different, but when do you sort of start to see them let down and, and really relax? It takes, um, it does weeks, take a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, you usually find that they come and they sort of um, take a little bit of a dive just because they're getting used to the um, surrounds, especially if they haven't been here before. But mm -hmm. And the change of feed as well. Yeah, yeah. and like they always take a little dive and then they, they come back up um, within two weeks. Um, but that's something we closely monitor and if it's not happening, well maybe um, there's a reason for it and that's okay. when you can um, do some more investigating. But nine times out of 10, they'll be, you know, and they probably are very relaxed in their paddocks to start with. And then after a couple of weeks, you notice a big change in them, very um, alert and um, yep. wanting to have a little bit more of a run round and yeah, play to play. So yeah, that's a good sign though that they're, you know, they're feeling more relaxed and yep. they're on their way up.
Moving on to a little bit more of what you do personally with the yearling preparations, um, we've got the ready rounds coming up soon and then after that obviously the, the yearling sales. You guys do a lot of, of work around that time, don't you? Yeah, it's all about to kick off um, probably next week for us with the um, yearling preparation. Um, the yearlings are already mostly in and being rugged for a couple of weeks and um, individually paddocked. Um, but yeah, the hard yards will start in a couple of weeks and um, yeah, right through until um, March really for us. It's exciting, um, you know, it's our time. It's our time in the sun probably, you know, um, at Karaka and then travelling horses to Australia. It's, it's always a little bit stressful, but usually when we're there, you know, you get the rewards. It's all really worthwhile. At what point did you sort of start purchasing for yourselves? Uh, I think the first time we started pinocking, Sarah and I was back at when we were at Mapley. Mm -hmm. um, we'd actually seen, we'd been watching people like Maureen and Bruce Harvey do it and we thought, oh, this might be a good uh, chance for us to sort of make some money on the side and we yep. decided to um, back our judgement and I, um, I, went over, I went to, actually went to Melbourne and um, started looking at weanlings over there and um, I found one and <laughs> I brought it back and uh, from there it just sort of started, yeah, he, um, I think we paid about 16000 for him and then um, sold him at Cracker for about eighty. so it sort of it started off okay, so we thought this is too, this is easy, <laughs> which is not always no. easy, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, from there on we just sort of, we started buying a, um, one or two every year and um, and then it started to grow from there and become our, uh, our, our, sort of our passion, our niche and, and what we do. We yeah. both look at them and yeah. then we make a list and then at the end of the day um, we sit down and Discuss you know, them. Um, but we have probably got similar tastes and whether mm. that's uh, come around because of what we do and we we've, um, respect each other for um, each other's opinions. Opinions, and, yeah. but um, yeah we don't have too many arguments on... Um, Not too many. <laughs> Mark, makes, Mark <laughs> makes it a final decision anyway. Oh, no, so. but, no, it is good. We, we, we enjoy actually we bounce off each other, and um, you know, it's something you'll you'll miss, and mm. um, and it's good to have someone a second opinion on something because you you know it, it, you don't always get it right, and um, it's always good to have another someone to blame when it goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so you've had a, a sort of a long and enjoyable relationship with the yearling sales. Has there been a highlight? Um, probably my highlight was um, Norzita. Mm. Um, selling her, although she didn't actually go through Henley Park, we prepared her, but she was our only premier that year, so we she went through Windsor Park. Um, but yeah, um, we had a, quite a good relationship with um, Duncan Ramage, and he ended up buying the filly on my recommendation, so it was great to see her come out and be a champion. <laughs> and for you? Uh, well, it was a pin hook actually. It was a, a Northern Meter cult that we um, paid seventy thousand for out of the out of the paddock, and. Uh, we um, we targeted the Sydney Sydney sale and uh, we got we sold them for three hundred and sixty thousand I think it was so it was a good um yeah, it was a good little profit in it and uh, but yeah it doesn't always happen that way but when you do get those surprises it's um, it makes it so so enjoyable. Coming up, there's something you can highlight for us that you're really excited about preparing. Uh, we've got a few there that we've. we've to be fair, we have quite a nice draft this year, and um, even the, uh, the top end's very, very strong. We've got a lovely um, Fastnet Rock Colt, uh, and a nice, uh, very nice Ifraj Colt. The two that are, that are very, there's a little quality about them, and yeah. But overall, I think you know we have got a very nice draft of horses to um, to represent us and, and our clients. Probably in all sales, you know, we've got a mm. very even lineup that we're happy with at yeah. this stage. So. Um, three months' time, we'll be fingers we'll crossed. We'll know that. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're at Tarapa for the New Zealand Bloodstock Ready to Run sales for two-year-olds, the Breeze Ups, and I can tell you it's a pretty breezy day. We caught up with some of the Bloodstock agents to find out their thoughts on what they're looking for at the Breeze Ups. I think the most important thing is time, you know, and we also look into the action, actually, so that's very important for me. And another thing very important for people looking for horses in, for China is that we know some horses, you know, race really good in China, but you want to see the information on the book. We like to see how they stride out and uh, keep an eye on that. A lot of the horses we've already seen as yearlings, whether it be the sales here or Australia, so we've got a lot of notes on the horses already, but action's the key thing we're looking for today. Well, generally you're looking for a horse that's 
obviously been well, edu well educated and not over revved. You know, you want to say that you can do that later, so to your to your own specifications. Like you look at a reasonably quick breeze up, but one that you can see this potential that, that can improve on that on the other side of the side. Quite simply, I, I like to see a nice fluent action. You want to see them come down the straight, and I don't like to see them wasting energy in their action. They want to be nice and fluent, sort of moving forward. You know, don't like high knees or a high head carriage, and generally just want to see them doing it under their own head of steam and quite naturally, you know, don't like to see them being ridden along and sort of a happy horse in the straight. Movement, athleticism, stride length, temperament, soundness, that's five, so more than one. <laughs>
She has produced four foals to race, all winners, including the stakes placed in five-time race-winning Ifraj Philly Fashion Princess. He breezed up at a time of 10.28 seconds. Lot 99 presented by Lindhurst Farm is a bay colt by Exceed and Excel out of the winning and costed Lago Mare Dreamworker. This is a family of stakes winners Timberina, Armed for Action, Media, Cardinal Virtue and Tash B. He breezed up in a time of 11.6 seconds. Lot 143 presented by Westbury Stud is the Bay Colt by High Chaparral out of the winning more than ready mare Go Kate Go. Here's one of four lots by the ill-fated High Chaparral, whose progeny have enjoyed a remarkable spring carnival through Melbourne Cup winner Rick Kindling, Victoria Derby winner Ace High and Group 3 Lexus Stakes winner Cis Montaigne. He breezed up in a time of 10.8 seconds. Lot 172 presented by Jamison Park is a bay colt by not a single doubt out of the BN Coney Merger to me. This is the family of stakes winners at Apaho Miss, the Little Engine and Monarchy. He breezed up in a time of 11.27 seconds. Lot 174 presented by Paramore is a bay colt by Fastnet Rock out of Jolie's Shinju, who is a champion mare in Singapore. She has produced four foals to race, all winners including Group 2 Shadow Stakes and Group 3 Chairman Stakes winner and Group 1 Place Philly Formality, who is a full sister to this colt. He breezed up in a time of 10.43 seconds. Lot 192 presented by Lindhurst Farm is a brown gelding by champion sire Savabelle out of the winning Monsieur Mare Le Belle Epoque. This is a family of stakes winners Andra, Zeta Moss and Super Molly. He breezed up in a time of 10.86 seconds. Lot 222 presented by Riversley Park is a brown colt by I Am Invincible out of the winning Grand Lodge Mare Masonette. He is a half-brother to Group 2 Autumn Stakes winner Peter Tear and a close relative of Group 2 Sandown Guineas winner Morton's Fork. He breezed up in a time of 10.84 seconds. Lot 307 presented by JK Farm is a chestnut colt by More Than Ready out of the Group 1 winning Fast and Famous Mare Quintessential. This is her first living foal. He breezed up in a time of 10.75 seconds. Lot 424 presented by Surrey Farm is a bay colt by Pur Canto out of the Galileo Mare Wants and Singy. He is the half-brother to recent Group 2 Wakeful Stakes winner and Group 1 VRC Oaks fourth place getter Lover Lover, who was sold through the sale last year. He breezed up in a time of 11.55 seconds. The New Zealand Bloodstock Ready to Run sale kicks off next Wednesday at 11am and you can find all the information you need at www.nzb.co.nz. In Kiwi Brood News this week, Waikato stud Savabil enjoyed another stellar weekend, headlined by Sun and Bellish, securing an invaluable Group 1 win in Saturday's Albasti Equiworld 2000 Guineas at Rickerton. Bred by Waikato stud, Embellish was a $775,000 Karaka yearling purchase for Tiakau Racing's David Ellis, who along with his wife Karen syndicated the colt who claimed his third win from four starts in the three-year-old classic. A brother to Group 1 winner Diadem, Embellish has significantly increased his value as a stallion proposition, with trainers Stephen Ortridge and Jamie Richards likely to frame a Sydney autumn campaign. In Singapore on Sunday, Gold Centre Gelding Gilt Complex headed a New Zealand-bred Quinella with Bahana at Cranji in the Group 1 Singapore Gold Cup. Bred by Dr John O'Brien, Gilt Complex is out of the Zabil mare San Zabil. He was purchased for $10,000 out of Newmarket Lodge's 2013 NZB Festival Yearling Draft by Anna Scott for owners Graham Mackey and his wife Trish Donnell. In Australia, Waikato stud-bred four-year-old mare Savapinski continued Savabeel's role when she took out the Group 2 Matriarch Stakes at Flemington for trainers Gay Waterhouse and Adrian Bott, who paid $70,000 for her at the 2015 NZB Select Yearling Sale. 
Back in New Zealand, the Whakanui bred Alamosa mare Aspen Lass claimed the listed Metropolitan Handicap at Rickerton for trainer Terry Ray. Whilst at Tarapa, the Richard Collett trained Untamed Diamond boosted her broodmare credentials with a win in the listed Legacy Lodge Sprint. We end this week's edition of Kiwi Bread News with a look at the first crop of foals from well-filled stud stallion Vesper.